Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, Peter gave us a really nice lecture yesterday giving an overview of this program on geometric polynomials, some of the real numbers. Uh, and today he's going to continue and he's going to tell us about uh, representations of G of R. Thanks. All right, uh, so. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, representations of uh, real linkers. So as we saw in the second talk yesterday, uh, there are some non-trivial questions in setting up a good theory because there is some kind of, you really need to have your real group acting on some kind of topological vector spaces and uh, this brings up some kind of issues in functional analysis. Um, and so today I wanna explain how, how we address them and what the resulting formalism looks like. Um, so, Yes, yeah, so let me start by stating the definition right away, but I will use a little bit of formalism in it uh, that I will then explain afterwards. But I just want to give you the flavor of the definition right away. Um, uh, so, so G of R, uh, it's a real Lie group. <clears throat> and so the way I will think about this is, a, is as a group object in real analytic manifolds. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so the definition will be that, okay, I will immediately define a derived category. Um, you have our representations. Defined to be uh, the derived category of quasi coherent sheaves <clears throat> on a certain analytic stack. And uh, talking about analytic stacks will be what I will do start in five minutes. Um, and so it's basically the quotient stack, uh, the classifying stack of, of this uh, G of R. Um, so this is some a stack that's defined over. Uh, some incarnation of uh, spectrum of real numbers. So unspec stands for analytic spectrum, whatever that means. Um, and then takes a classifying stack. So you mod out by, by G of R, where G of R is considered as a group object in real analytic manifolds and is incarnated as an analytic space in this way. Oh. Um, so giving a definition like this uh, is very much uh, inspired by the work that uh, Rodriguez Camargo and Rodriguez Racinto have done in the PDA case where they've reinterpreted Schneider Teitelbaum theory of locally analytic periodic representation in precisely this form that these are quasi coherent sheaves on a locally analytic classifying stack. Um, and uh, this very much suggested to use the same perspective also over the real numbers. Uh, Uh, let me give one indication how this addresses one of these issues that came up yesterday, like which version of, in this induced representation, do you consider smooth functions, real analytic functions, what kind of functions do you consider? So, <clears throat> um, how, like usually sheaves on a classifying stack, they are more or less the same thing as g equivalent objects over the point by some kind of descent. And so in particular, like there, there is this map covering the point again by covering the quotient, uh, covering the classifying stack again by, by just a point. Um, let's call this map F. So then we have, using pullback under F, we can realize, we can realize uh, <clears throat> uh, any object in here as being a vector space over the real numbers. So in other words, a quasi coherent sheaf on this analytic spectrum of R uh, that is actually equi equipped at least with an action of the abstract group G of R. Uh, but there are actually two ways of doing this. Uh, there's, some other, there's a usual pullback functor and there's the exceptional inverse image functor. <clears throat> and for a slightly funny reason, turns out that there's a canonical transformation in this case from the usual pullback to the upper shriek pullback. And what will happen is that <clears throat> um, 
like so for example, in the used representation, we'll have a unique object in here. But when you actually want to think of this as a vector space equipped with an action, you have to use one of these functors to realize it this way. And uh, this functor will correspond to the minimal globalization. And this functor will correspond to the maximal globalization. So in some sense, the objects in here are realizations of, an, for example, an induced representation that are in some sense simultaneously the minimal and the maximal globalization. <clears throat> Yeah, so, yeah, it's a slightly funny computation that uh, turns out that if you put, take upper upper shriek of the unit, you get the unit. Uh, uh, yes, you get the unit. Uh, maybe maybe up to so slightly, slightly non-canonically, but yes. Uh, and so in general, there... I mean, there's always a transformation from uh, like this, and in some of for for a slightly funny reason, that's actually mapped like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <clears throat> uh, all right. So, uh, so now I need to explain what the formalism is in which this is supposed to, all this is supposed to happen. And so this is this formalism of analytic stacks. Uh, that's all joined uh, with Dustin Clausen. It's work we've done, we started, uh, well, well, six years ago. Um, and we just gave a long course uh, joined between Paris and Bonn uh, about this stuff. So we can watch many lectures on YouTube about this. Um, so let me just give you an extremely quick overview. Uh, okay. So, <clears throat> so it's, it is meant to be a, a, a version of, uh, similar to algebraic geometry um, and the usual theory of stacks. Um, but in a way where you can really yeah, do non-trivial analysis to you really have, uh, you can embed some complex analytic geometry in there, you can embed p rigid analytic geometry in there, um, yeah, and so on. So in particular, the basic objects, they shouldn't just be abstract rings, they should be some kind of topological rings. <clears throat> but also when you work with modules, you maybe just don't want abstract tensor products, you want completed tensor products and so on. And usually this is a very subtle story uh, but uh, using this formalism of condensed mathematics, we found a way uh, to address these issues quite cleanly. Uh, so so, so here's, here's the basic steps in setting this up. And I will not be able to supply all the details. So the starting point is that we have a theory of what we call analytic rings. Um, <clears throat> so these will these are things of which there will be some kind of analytic spectrum and then general analytic stacks will be glued out of those. Um, and so what is an analytic ring? Uh, roughly speaking, um, <clears throat> it's a topological ring uh, plus a notion of which topological modules are complete. Um, in a way, but we want to be stay in a setting where we can do homological algebra as usual. So we want the category of complete topological modules to be in a being category, which usually fails extremely drastically. Like even topological being groups, they're just not in a being category. You cannot meaningfully take whole kernels. Um, so uh, the first modification to this we do is that we replace a topological uh, by condensed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, 
And also, for technical reasons, more or less, we also need to uh, make everything derived. So we need to pass some world of derived algebraic geometry or derived algebraic geometry. Um, right, but then, <coughs> yeah, so, so, we, so we have some so derived things we, for some reason we call animated. Um, so we have some animated condensed commutative ring. And so such a thing will automatically have a derived category of condensed A modules. <coughs> um, or just a V in category, sorry, maybe I just need to be in category. So I'll, this will be in the B in category. <coughs> and then to define an analytic ring is to specify a certain subcategory of the condensed A modules called the complete condensed A modules. That depends on your analytic ring, um, which should be stable under all the, basically all the operations you, can, you might think of. So it's stable under kernels, core kernels, limits, core limits, internal homes, internal X, uh, okay. <clears throat> and uh, I will discuss examples uh, of this structure in a bit. Um, <clears throat> then on this category of analytic rings, we define a certain Grothendieck topology. On this category analytic rings or it's opposite, uh, or you want to say it, um, uh, where the critical uh, condition is that uh, critical uh, is a ratum is that sending any analytic ring A to the derived category of complete A modules. Suitably interpreted, um, uh, that this is a uh, satisfies descent. Oh, which, of course, uh, only makes sense if you actually pass to derived infinity categories. Okay, but Jacob Leary uh, has established all the foundations one needs. Um, And uh, and then analytic sex are basically just chiefs uh, on analytic rings uh, for this work with topology. Okay, and so there's all sorts of little bells and whistles uh, one should really say, for example, working with, I mean, these are really sheaves of, of, of infinity groupoids, of anima. Um, in which case there is some issue between sheaves and hyper sheaves, and we actually consider something strictly in between. Hmm. Ignore. Um, <clears throat> Let's rather study some examples. Um, well, first, let me do some kind of, uh, just for the, for the uh, analytic sex. So, so any analytic ring A, and uh, I will again give examples in, in a moment, um, <coughs> uh, defines uh, some of Bionida, an analytic stack called the analytic spectrum, which is just a, uh, the functor that takes any B to, to the home from A to B. 
<clears throat> and then all the analytic stacks are somehow generated on the columns by, by these things. Oops. Sorry. Uh, Um, okay, maybe this is just one example right now, uh, because I want to say a few more words about the abstract theory before uh, discussing examples in more detail. Um, <clears throat> so, so you have this function that takes any a to d of a. Uh, let me, I mean, d of a denotes this derived value of complete a modules. Um, so this, uh, we asked that this is a, is a sheaf, and so this basically means that we can now define this for any analytic stack. So extends to a functor. Now from analytic stacks to uh, symmetric model categories. Infinity categories. I mean, actually presentable ones. Um, yeah, taking any A, uh, any X, to what we call the derived category of quasi Korean sheaves on X. <coughs> and uh, it's contravariant, which is clear enough. Um, <coughs> so in particular, uh, you have some operations. You can always form a, a tensor on the derived category of quasi Korean sheaves on X, which concretely you should think of as some kind of completed tensor product of modules. <clears throat> and uh, it has an adjoint, an internal home. <clears throat> and also, if you have a map uh, of analytic stacks, then you get a pullback map. Uh, which is a tensor functor. <clears throat> and it has a right adjoint. And for a star. But then something very interesting happens, which doesn't usually happen when you consider quasi coherent sheaves. Uh, namely, you also have a notion of compactly supported coherent cohomology. Moreover, uh, for many, not all, but really quite a, quite a lot, uh, for many maps, f from x to y, um, <clears throat> you also have an f lower shriek. Uh, in the graph value of quasi coherent sheaves to f x to y. Um, <coughs> uh, satisfying the usual property, so satisfying the projection formula and base change. And again, it has a right to join. So, um, so if you, in usual coherent cohomology of schemes, uh, you don't really have classically any notion of complex support coherent cohomology, um, except that, I mean, for example, there's this appendix of Deline to Hartson's residues and duality, uh, where he observes that if you consider some kind of pro-coherent sheaves, then you can get this complex support coherent cohomology. And like these pro-coherent sheaves, they are some instance of something like topological modules. And so this is the first indication maybe that by passing to some word of topological modules, we could hope to have such functors of complex support coherent cohomology. And yeah, we do get them in very large generality and they in particular they generalize uh, uh, that functor that Deline uh, constructed. Um, so in particular, like this formalism also gives you uh, very general forms of some kind of Grotendi duality in coherent cohomology. Uh, yeah, given analytically. Um, right, uh, so, and then, uh, right, in particular for, uh, for, for, for um, Grotnik duality, it's somehow important to know some 
uh, some relations between these different functors. And so for example, one can say that f is proper um, if, in quotation marks, because it's not quite a condition that seems, uh, f lower streak is equal to f lower star. Uh, one can actually make the definition of properness so that it's really a condition and this uh, becomes like a canonical identification when this condition is satisfied. And uh, one can say that f is maybe cohomologically smooth if uh, the upper shriek is basically the upper star, except that usually you do have to really put a twist there. And again, the precise definitions are slight variants of this, but that's the idea. <clears throat> All right, so the, the upshot of this discussion is that <clears throat> we found a way to have some notion of analytic rings, which have nice categories of complete topological modules with a complete tensor product and with a nice, very nice derived category. So we can really do combine homological algebra and functional analysis and uh, building from, starting from these analytic rings, we can build an ambient category of analytic stacks by uh, uh, passing to geometry. And on that world, some on the category of quasi and chiefs, you have this full formalism of six functors. Uh, yeah, I mean, like in the in the in the um, affine case, they 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 just have a t-structure, and then you can ask just by descent, you can put a t-structure if you want to. So, so uh, uh, I'm not claiming that being, ah, uh, sorry, uh, uh, no. Uh, no. So, yeah, you can have something that's locally connective on something affinity, but not globally connective. So, yes, you have to, yeah, so not really, it doesn't really globalize very nicely as a two structure. Yeah? Well, it's a subcategory that's stable under all limits and columns. So it has, we always use a left adjoint that it has. In principle, it also has a right adjoint, but I never think about that. And I don't recommend doing it. Um, All right, so uh, let's discuss some examples. Um, uh, so for this, I should maybe say, what 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 are these? Uh, what is this condensed set stuff all about? Uh, so this is re re uh, the starting point of this is <clears throat> to define this category of condensed sets that's in some sense meant to be a replacement of the category of topological spaces, and this is uh, defined to be sheaves on the category of profinite sets uh, <clears throat> for the Grotenik topology of finite families of jointly surjective maps. And uh, being a category of sheaves, then, uh, it's automatically, to and then there is some set theoretic issues. Ignore. Um, uh, being a category of sheaves, it's, 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 it's topos, and you uh, have lots of nice properties, in particular if you pass to being group objects, like on any, any topos, it is in the BN category. Um, and there is a functor from topological spaces there, um, which uh, takes any topological space X to, this, to the functor that takes any profinite set S to the continuous maps from S to X. <coughs> uh, we call that X underlined, which isn't quite fully faithful, but is fully faithful on a very large class of topological spaces, for example, all compactly generated ones. Um, so in practice, you can think that this is basically an enlargement of the category of topological spaces. And the new objects you get are certain non-housed of uh, quotient objects. So for example, you could be taking uh, the real numbers, mod the rational numbers, I mean, with a discrete topology, so with a natural topology, mod the discrete topology, and 
this is, I mean, as a topological space, this is indiscrete, but as a condensed set, this still has a reasonable structure. Uh, or you could do even something more drastic. You could take the real numbers with a natural topology and divide out by the real numbers with a discrete topology. Um, <laughs> and classically, this is just a point, but as a, as a condensed set being group, um, this is almost still the thing that sends a profile set S to the continuous maps to here and modulo the locally constant maps. And it's still uh, non trivial. And so, because there are these, you can take these quotients in an interesting way. This is what makes it possible that condensed being groups are in a being category. Right? And so, yeah. So, basic throughout, we replace in all our like, homological algebra kind of the every occurrence of something like a topological ring, topological module, whatever, it's always replaced by its condensed incarnation. <clears throat> um, and so then, uh, for a condensed ring A, um, uh, the category of condensed A modules, uh, this category is an abelian category which is generated by A join S, where S is a profinite set S. This is the point. <clears throat> and so to give an analytic ring structure uh, is the same thing as to say what the, the completions of these guys are. Analytic ring. Need to specify what the complete, what the completions of these guys are. <clears throat> And you should think of this as specifying some notion of A-valued measures on S, where this guy would just be some kind of Dirac measures, and these are some more general measures. Uh, and so the first example of an analytic ring that we found uh, was Z solid. <clears throat> um, where the complete modules uh, are related to the classical notion of complete uh, linearly topologized being groups. <clears throat> and uh, the precise way that you do, like the free solid module on a profinite set S, there are two ways to describe it. Either if you have a profinite set S written as a limit of finite sets as I, you could say that this is the limit of the free to be in groups on the SIs. And a different way to think about this is it's really that just z valued measures on S. So it's really just internal hum from the continuous functions, continuous integer value functions on z back to z. <coughs> so it's just z valued measures on S. Uh, so this works very well for, for, for non-Archimedean geometry because non-Archimedean geometry really uh, being groups have some kind of linear topology. The, op uh, the topology has a basis of open, open subgroups. But uh, in Archimedean geometry, this doesn't work at all. Um, so then we found uh, something we called R liquid. Um, Um, so there the complete, so this actually depends on a parameter, some number between zero and one. <clears throat> Where the complete modules are related to the more classical theory of something like complete locally convex things, but actually have to allow certain non-convex vector spaces as well. So you need to allow something like less than alpha lo lo locally convex. 
Look from very locally. And that's another convex topological statistics. <coughs> Proving that this satisfies the axioms of an analytic ring is an extremely hard computation that I still don't fully understand. Um, uh, even more recently, we found yet another one called our guess. Uh, our guess is. Um, <clears throat> which is very hard to describe explicitly, but is uh, proving that it exists is much easier. It's somehow a much nicer theory. Uh, um, yeah, but the, the complete ones are. It's a very large class. In particular, it contains all of these things for all alpha. Uh, but but even, even more. <clears throat> yeah, so if you need to fix this parameter alpha, yeah. It's a bit awkward, but. So originally we hoped you could just, uh, so th there's an obvious guess for how you should produce an analytic ring if you try to mirror just complete locally convex topological vector spaces, but then it doesn't actually work. The reason is that you can have extensions of Banach spaces in topological vector spaces which are not themselves locally convex. There's an example of Ribbe from 1980 uh, having to do with the entropy functional. Um, right, so you need to, somehow, if you want your category of complete modules to be stable and extensions need to allow non-locally convex things. All right. Uh, yeah, this is already loud in the liquid, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, so the, the examples you would have here are, yeah, like an L piece or L alpha of, I don't know, L. the integer of something like this would be in there. <clears throat> okay, um, so in any of these series of the real numbers, it's some of the case that if you have M and N complex analytic or real analytic manifolds, then you can take the algebra functions on M, holomorphic or real analytic functions on M and tensor it with the ones on N in either our, our gas or our liquid. And it turns out that this completed tensor product will automatically be uh, the homomorphic functions of the product. So this is a somewhat difficult computation. But I mean, this is precisely what you want from, uh, from the theory that some, uh, like if you take fiber products in our category of analytic stacks, like on the level of rings, this will correspond to taking tensor products in this, in this sense. And we want that to mirror the usual notion of products that we, we, we already know. So we need to have uh, some property like that. <clears throat> Right, so uh, actually uh, for this whole series that I'm developing uh, in these lectures, um, <clears throat> what I will do is I, I have this non-trivial analytic ring structure on the reals where I can choose either liquid or the gaseous one, it doesn't matter which one you choose. But then on any algebra over the real numbers, I can just say that the module is complete if it's complete as just an, it's an R vector space. And I will, own, so this is what we call an induced analytic ring structure. And I will endow all my analytic, uh, all my condensed rings over the real numbers just with the induced analytic ring structure. I will need, not need to uh, put some kind of relative notion of completeness. So there are very good, interesting examples for having like non-induced analytic ring structures, uh, but it will not be important uh, uh, this week. <clears throat> all right. Uh, so let's actually now discuss. So. Yesterday I was mentioning 
that I want to do some geometry where it's very important to clearly distinguish between like something like the complex numbers incarnated as either a complex analytic manifold or a real analytic manifold as just a topological space and not. And so let me now discuss uh, all the possible incarnations of something like a complex manifold or a real analytic manifold uh, in the world of these analytic stacks. And to discuss these incarnations, uh, I do want to get rid of one subtlety, namely the coefficients. So I can also always incarnate them either with coefficients over real numbers or the complex numbers, which is another subtlety on top, sprinkle on top. Uh, let me ignore that and constantly work over uh, the complex numbers already. Um, and take your favorite choice of gaseous or liquid. Um, <clears throat> So then, first of all, there, there is a functor that takes schemes to analytic stacks uh, over C, in a sense, um, which is just glued uh, from taking the spectrum of just some, some ring A to the analytic spectrum of A. And I want to denote that by x maps to uh, x algebraic because it's the algebraic incarnation functor. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's A with some of the relative discrete topology, I should say. So. Um, So being very precise, I mean, usually A is just a discrete thing, but I want to work over the, 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 the usual condensed algebra. So you can tend over the discrete complex numbers with the usual complex numbers with this natural topology. <coughs> um, uh, then you have uh, C analytic spaces. Uh, so yeah, schemes over C, yeah. Then you have complex analytic spaces mapping to analytic stacks. We'll see. Um, which is glued from the following. Um, <clears throat> so if you have a complex analytic space, uh, then there is a notion of a Stein compact subset. Uh, for example, a closed polydisc or something terrific closed in a closed polydisc. <clears throat> um, and you send any such uh, close Stein thing to the algebra of overconvergent holomorphic functions on K. And so in general, this X will then be mapped to like the, the co limit or really the union over all such compact Stein subsets of the analytic spectrum. What's these overconvergent guys? <clears throat> and for some reason, the classical complex analysis literature, this notion of Stein complex isn't stressed so much, but it's actually a really nice analog of like the Finoid subspaces and rigid geometry. <clears throat> In particular, under a very mild topological assumption on K, for example, if it's really closely closed in the closed polydex, so there's really an Assyrian algebra here. Excellent, and if it's a smooth manifold, and uh, it's regular and so on. Um, so similarly, you can go from real analytic spaces to analytic stacks. Still over C. I mean, you could, these you could also map to this analytic stacks over R, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, uh, this is actually very constructed in basically the same way. So again, there is a notion of Stein compact subset of real analytic manifold, and you can again uh, define the algebra of overconvergent holomorphic functions. I should say. Overconvergent means they converge in a slightly larger subset, and so this is endowed with its usual topology or its usual condensed structure, which is some dual nuclear Fréché space.
Right, in the real anti case, yeah, actually, uh, there is this very nice embedding theorem that they basically all, uh, 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 yeah, it's fine, right. Um, so in particular, this real analytic functor will be the one I use for my real Lie group. Yeah. Um, it went up to three so far, I believe. So next is uh, four. Um, let's say uh, S is a compact host of space. So, yeah, so there's a functor from this compact host of spaces uh, to analytic stacks of a C. Which just takes any such S and maps it to uh, the analytic spectrum of the continuous functions. <clears throat> but there's also yet another one, yet another functor from compact also spaces, the analytic stacks, uh, which is kind of using the condensed perspective. So any, any compact host of space admits a surjection from a profinite set. And so somehow as a stack, it's a quotient of a profinite set by a profinite equivalence relation. So to, to find this functor, it's enough to say what a profinite set goes to. And the profinite set goes to just the locally constant functions. Locally constant. Let's just see. And so these incarnations, they kind of all interact. So let me give just one example. Uh, so here are, some here are some incarnations of like the one-dimensional projective space. <clears throat> so you can take either P1C as just a topological space. So in other words, as, as uh, S2, so this is related to like the continuous functions. S2 to C. Or you can incarnate it. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, I didn't give names to all these functors. It's what I would call the locally analytic version, which is incarnated uh, in terms of uh, as a real analytic manifold. So this corresponds to the real analytic functions on S2 to C. Um, this maps to so this incarnated as a complex analytic thing, which I would denote by analytic. Um, so this is locally given by holomorphic functions. Um, <clears throat> this maps to the algebraic incarnation, which is somehow in some sense locally given by algebraic or polynomial functions. <clears throat> and this in turn is uh, mapped to uh, this last incarnation of some locally constant functions, uh, which I will call the condensed incarnation. Um, so here you have locally constant functions, uh, which of course, globally there are a few locally constant functions, but when you cover by profinite set, there are. And these are not all different uh, because it actually turns out that the complex analytic and the algebraic incarnation are isomorphic. Uh, which is an instance of Gaga. But now, not just as an equivalence of coherent cheese, but really as an isomorphism of spaces. So, a lot of things are now, you can, you can cleanly separate between a lot of things, but some things are actually non-trivially isomorphic, particularly like Gaga becomes an isomorphism of analytic stacks. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so this, this would be defined over C also as a, this is a discrete analytic ring. And okay, so this would be something else, but. It's a fiber product, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, good. 
So, uh, as an application of this formalism, first one, <clears throat> I want to talk about one incarnation of Riemann Hilbert. Some kind of analytic Riemann Hilbert. <clears throat> so let's say X is a complex manifold. And then <clears throat> uh, we want to relate D modules, uh, uh, have some relation between D modules on X uh, and just sheaves on uh, the underlying topological space. <clears throat> um, turns out that uh, sheaves on, on this thing, this is basically just the derived category of X of C incarnated as a condensed set. So this is functor from five. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you prove that by descent and like for a profinite set, Giving a sheaf on a profinite set is the same thing as giving a module over the global sections, uh, which are locally constant functions. Somebody said it holds here. Um, <clears throat> and we're trying to be in a more analytic setting, so we were really wanted some kind of analytic D modules. Um, uh, so, roughly speaking, we want to have something like really D cap modules, um, or D, like I think classically in complex analysis, is called D infinity some ring of infinite order differential operators. Um, and so, I mean, classically, it's a little bit subtle again to define what what's the, this good category of uh, modules over this algebra of infinite order differential operators is. Uh, but using this formalism of analytic stacks, you can actually give a very clean definition. Uh, so this is mirroring something that was done algebraically uh, by Simpson when X is a smooth scheme. Uh, then the carrier of D modules on X, or the derived carrier of such, is just uh, the derived carrier of quasi and sheaves on the Durham stack of X, <clears throat> where this is the quotient of X uh, by the formal completion of the diagonal of X as an in-scheme. So you, like, the, the in-scheme of all infinitesimal labor thickenings of the diagonal, which gives you some equivalence relation on X and you can formally pass to the quotient in some world of stacks. And then I know Grotenik's perspective on like modules with a flat connection as being some, uh, is exactly as vector bundles on here. And so slightly more fancy, some of D modules on X are for the current sheets on that stack. And we're somewhat taking inspiration from that and trying to mirror that, but we want some kind of analytic D modules which have some kind of stronger convergence properties which should mean that we should replace this formal completion along the diagonal with some uh, larger subset, with some stronger convergence properties. So there, so analytically, this leads to this notion of the analytic Durham stack. Um, <clears throat> which is, again, something that Rodriguez Camargo uh, has found in the Pierde case first. Um, and so, Back to being X being, say, a complex manifold, you define the analytic Durham stack of X to be the quotient of X by now the overconvergent neighborhood uh, of the diagonal. So locally, some of this means you take the like, functions that converge in a small neighborhood uh, of the diagonal. <clears throat> 
And then you can again analyze what these quasi current sheaves on this analytic realm stack are. And yeah, so there, there's a full subcategory of the modules over this P infinity uh, in the drug. So there are some kind of the infinity modules. All right, so there, there's one stack where the sheaves, where the cross and sheaves are just the, the kind of Betty sheaves. And there's another stack where the cross and sheaves are these analytic D modules. And now the kind of analytic Riemann Hilbert theorem is just uh, the theorem that these stacks are actually isomorphic. The analytic ROM stack is just isomorphic to this XC point. <clears throat> In particular, the, the, the derived carriers of quasi current sheaves are equivalent, which gives you uh, this relation between D modules and Betty sheaves. And this is basically a tautology. Uh, so we defined this to be a quotient of this, but there's also a natural map here, which is also quite obviously a quotient, a subjective map in all growth nick topology. So to say that this is an isomorphism, you just have to say that the equivalence relation is the same. But if you think about what the equivalence relation for this rejection is, you immediately realize that actually this is just this, more or less by definition. So, okay. <clears throat> But I mean, it, it gives you some slightly non-trivial consequences. For example, you see that the infinite order differential operators are just the endomorphisms as purely sheaves of C-vector spaces of the structure sheaf. Uh, some, so this relates to some kind of classical stuff. I don't know. Um, right, uh, I actually want to talk about representation of the group. So let's, so let's go back to uh, G of R representation. <clears throat> and so one thing I discussed yesterday was induced representations and there we had this kind of run into this issue that we weren't sure which uh, function space to take. So let's talk about induced representations from this perspective. So the principal series representations. <clears throat> so maybe for this again, you fix a torus and a Borel in G. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then one way to think now think about parabolic induction in terms of the stacks is that you have this quotient stack for T of R. So point is just the analytic spectrum of the complex numbers now. with either the gaseous or liquid structure. Um, then inflating a representation to the Borel is just pullback. And uh, induction is just push forward. So it turns out that this map is actually proper, so it doesn't actually matter which push forward you take. <clears throat> and so, so a character of the torus uh, gives you a, a sheave on here, and then Uh, then the induction from E to G of chi is the thing that corresponds to uh, F upper star uh, G lower star of chi. Okay. So this way, using these, these morphisms of stacks, you can write down a quasi current sheet on this classifying stack. And now you can wonder, well, which which representation of G of R does this really correspond to? And maybe I shouldn't have used F and G now. Well, okay, so let me now call pi this map from point to point mode G of R. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, so to figure out what uh, what representation this corresponds to, you should somehow compute the pi upper star of this, for example. And then you realize that if you take the pi upper star, um, <clears throat> then you're basically computing, so you have this map pi, think to this quotient stack. Then you have a sheaf here, take the push forward here, and then because this is a proper map, you have proper base change, and g of r mod b of r is some of the flag variety of r. And maybe I should have always put this la here because I'm incarnating all of these things as real analytic manifolds. <clears throat> um, and so this means that this uh, uh, just corresponds to the push forward from a certain local system here downstairs. And so let's, let's say just we take the trivial representation here. Uh, then <clears throat> This really just corresponds to the global sections uh, on the flag variety as a real analytic thing, uh, uh, global sections of the structure sheaf, which is just uh, real analytic functions on the flag variety. Okay? Which is precisely the minimal globalization uh, of the induced representation. <coughs> But you could also uh, try to compute pi upper shriek instead, uh, which I sh said should correspond to the maximal globalization. And so let's quickly see how that would arise. So we have the same diagram. Um, but now, uh, okay, and so this is proper. Uh, no, sorry, I mean, yeah, so, and pi upper streak and g lower star, they always uh, satisfy base change. And so you, it's also the same thing as, well, taking the upper streak here, uh, right. And so, this is also the same thing as g prime lower star, pi prime upper streak of one. <clears throat> uh, but this, it turns out, is actually, well, it's the same thing as g prime of a trick of one. Um, and this is precisely the sheaf of hyperfunctions. So some of the dualizing object on a real analytic manifold is precisely the sheaf of hyperfunctions. And so this means that, and this g prime law stars again, just taking global sections. So you see that uh, this pi upper shriek functor will take that object on the classifying stack to uh, the hyperfunction realization. So we get C minus omega, the maximum globalization. All right. And so similarly, the discrete series representation Um, <clears throat> you will actually be re able to realize as the complex support cohomology uh, on the upper and lower half plane of just O, the uh, structure sheet, um, in its minimal globalization, or uh, you can also write it down uh, really directly as a sheet on the classifying stack. <clears throat> Oh, you put some line models there. And so, okay, so I basically out of time, let me just mention that one way one can really analyze this whole category of representations uh, is using uh, a version of the valence and Bernstein localization in the setting. There's some kind of analytic valence and Bernstein localization. Uh, closely related to the work uh, of Kashivara Schmidt. Uh, which would say in this case, for example, the following theorem. Um, that 
the category, or the drive category uh, uh, of G of R representations in, in the sense I'm talking about today uh, with trivial infinitesimal character. <clears throat> it's just equivalent to the category of sheaves on uh, the flag variety, the complex flag variety mod the real group. So some of uh, Betty sheaves if you want. And uh, so for example, if you care about the discrete series representations here, then <clears throat> There are as many open orbits here as there are supposed to be discrete series representations. And so for each open orbit, you can just take the, the, the sheaf extended by zero from that open orbit. Uh, and this will correspond as equivalence to the discrete series representation. <clears throat> and uh, proving this is actually very simple using our formalism. And maybe the key ingredient is precisely this analytic Riemann Hilbert correspondence, uh, which will allow you to go from this kind of local analytic representation theory. Uh, I mean, this translates, so there's always this overconvergence, which is very closely related to these analytic ram stacks, which also have this overconvergence. And then there's somewhere an analytic ram stack of the flag varieties that appears. Uh, and then by this analytic Riemann Hilbert correspondence, that's precisely the same thing as just Betty sheaves on the flag, Betty sheaves. Let me stop. <laughs> Right. Well, first of all, <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, maybe I screwed this up. So the drive category of quasi current sheaves on X, it turns out, is also just the same thing as modules over OX in just um, sheaves on X of C with values in like the drive category of C. Uh, sheaves. With the wise and rough category of like a liquid or gaseous C vector spaces. Um, and sorry, maybe I shouldn't have. Sorry, maybe I should. Sorry, maybe this quasi coherent here was nonsense. Put this here. <clears throat> um, uh, the full inclusion here is a little bit similar to uh, the following phenomenon. So when you take something like, uh, so any complex manifold, for example, just the affine line and incarnate this uh, in our way, then this is not a quasi-compact space. So it's not the analytic spectrum of the global holomorphic functions, but instead it's this rising union of like overconvergent holomorphic functions on disks. <clears throat> but it turns out that um, still the category of quasi and sheaves on our analytic space is a full subcategory of the uh, just modules over the algebra of holomorphic functions on the entire thing. But you somehow have to say that they are, so it's, it's just those modules that are the inverse limit over the things when you localize to smaller disks. And there is something similar here that the D infinity, uh, I mean, some kind of deformation of functions on the analytic cotangent bundle or some funny version of it, um, which is some kind of non quasi compact thing. And you need to again put a condition that they are some of the inverse limit of the localization to, 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 to bounded subsets. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, you, you still have a map. Like the category is still linear, just over the usual Harris Chandra center. 
and then it just turns over the hundred percent with a fixed infinitesimal character and then Uh, I don't know. I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the whole question of unitary representations is something that I'm not addressing at all with this formalism. Uh, it's an interesting question, but uh, yeah, so, so I've not thought about it. Let's say that. Yeah, I mean, Kashivara Smith basically proved that a very similar result in their world that of, like this. So, in some sense, you could, if you wanted to, parse through the, these equivalents of categories and then uh, do it. But yeah. Kashivara Smith, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so I think if you, yeah, so sorry, maybe I have a better answer. So if you really have a Harishandra module, then <clears throat> uh, Harishandra modules, I could also realize that quasi Korean sheaves on a certain stack. Um, where maybe these are really just Lie algebra representations, so, and Lie algebra representations are more like related to something doing something like a formal completion somewhere instead of this overconvergence thing. And, uh, but on the compact subgroup, you really just have some kind of finite dimensional. Or direct sum of finite dimensional things, so it's maybe exists on a locally analytic one. So I could have realized Harris Chandra modules in a rather simple way as quasi Korean chiefs on a certain stack, and that stack would uh, map towards towards uh, this thing I'm looking at, the classifying stack of G of R, um, and then so you can just push forward, and then I think this would give you the the right the right thing. <laughs> Maybe under some admissibility assumptions. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so you have G of R L A, and it maps to this incarnation just as a as a as a topological space or as a, as a where it is in a condensed set. Um, <clears throat> And inside there, you just have, for example, a maximal compact condensed set. And <clears throat> then you can take this fiber product here and get something here, which is some kind of node like this. And then <clears throat> this is actually more or less a version where modules on this, quasi Korean sheaves on this, are basically Harish Chandra modules. Except that you ask that the Lie algebra representation is actually some kind of locally analytic Lie algebra representation. So um, if you did it, did a further modification to this, uh, where the Lie algebra direction now becomes only formal, then you would more, more cleanly get uh, these things. Um, yeah. Uh, this is word for arbitrary really groups. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. 